our side alignment and windage and elevation. Get our cheek weld right. Make sure of our, uh, get us a range finder, find out how far we're going and we'll be ready. <laughs> Amen. Good to have everybody here today. Amen. We're going to get back in our study now. I don't know about you, but I enjoy the study of the Bible. And uh, I told you last week we'd bring this up with a dictionary. Our Father, I pray that you give me wisdom, Lord, in your word, and then give me the gift of teaching. We pray, Father, you'd open the hearts of the people to receive your word. And we're thankful, Amen. Heavenly Father, we have it, Lord. We have the truth. Thank you that you did not lead us here to try to find our way that you gave us the sweet Holy Spirit who ministers the truth to our hearts. In thy name we pray, amen. All right. Now this is half of an unabridged dictionary. So the dictionary is this thick. Amen. It's twice this. This is half of an unabridged. This is a fairly recent edition. It dates back to uh, 1904. So when you're looking at a dictionary and it says unabridged, that means that you're going to get a dictionary that will give you the etymology of the word, and it will also give you the meaning of it 125 years ago, and not as uh, gutter talk and street language has changed it. And, for example, we talked about the word express last week, where it's found in Hebrews 1.3. And if you'd like to turn there with me, we'll read that in the book of Hebrews, chapter number 1 and verse 3. Then we'll get back into our lesson, but we want to, I'd like to uh, just show you how that, uh, among other things, the honesty of the King James translators. Amen. In Hebrews 1.3, the Word of God says, Who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person and upholding all things of the Word by the Word of His power when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the Majesty on high. That's saying an awful lot in one sentence. And if you'll notice, the Scripture says the express image of his person. Well, there's no corresponding word in the Greek text for express. I don't know if I said that last week or not. I should have. But in the Greek text, in other words, the textus receptus or received text or whatever you want to call it, uh, there is no word for express. The word is for image, and that word is character, and it's... Uh, the way you'd say it in Greek is uh, it starts with a key, character. It's uh, tau, eta, rho, and you pronounce eta, a, long a, character, which in uh, the King James translators translated it express image. You see, they could have simply said image. Right. Who's the image of the invisible God? But uh, they used the term express image here. Why? Because they wanted to put emphasis on something. The word used here in reference to the image of Christ in Hebrews 1.3 is only used one time. Only one time in the whole New Testament. See, And being used just one time, then there must be... Uh, uh, when you use a word one time, then you're, probably, you're, you're putting emphasis on that word unless it only shows up in context, has a reason to use it one time, and that's the reason. It's so different from any of the rest of the words. And the King James translators use the word express. Now, that word express, we had a little uh, 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 question about where did the word come from and how was it used? Uh, well, here's where it came from. This is the way to, this, what I'm trying to do now is show you how to study on your own. And you don't have to depend upon what some man says to you. Right. You can take the Bible. The Bible says we have no need that a man teach us. We have an anointing. And you pray the Holy Spirit leads you and guides you into the truth. They won't flim flam you with modern theology. So how do I how do I know what that word means? Well, I get a, I get an unabridged dictionary that tells me where it came from. The dictionary will tell me how it was used two thousand years ago because I want to know where it came from. How did these people use it then? What did it mean then when they used it? Not what it means today. He that letteth will let to be taken out of the way. What, that, what does that word let mean today? 
normally in usage here in America. Not England, but here. Right. But uh, as it's used in the context of an English Bible, it means to hinder. See? So here's what it says in this unabridged dictionary about the word express. Now, as used in context, we have an express image. So what would that be? It modifies a noun. So what is it? It's an adjective, all right? So it's got the verb form, the adjective, and uh, it's also got it as a noun. But here it's used as an adjective, okay? Middle English, express. Latin, expressus. All right, so what did that tell me? It told me this. It told me that the first time that it showed up in the English language, it showed up in Middle English. And I told you last week the English language has gone through three separate, uh, uh, clearly defined uh, uh, how do you say it? Usages or types, periods. Old English, Middle English, Modern English. Modern English started long about 1600. So you take the King James Bible and you say, well, I need a book in Modern English. You've got one. If you're talking about street gutter talk, then you need to go find something else. But if you're talking about English, what does English, you know? We want to convey with the language. We don't want this garbage that they mumble out here on the street. What does it, what does, I won't communicate with somebody with a word that has a meaning. You see what I'm saying? A standard. There's a standard of judgment, a standard of excellence. And you weights and measures, they're standards. Right. And that's the way it is with this. So the first time it showed up in the English language, it showed up in Middle English. It came from Latin. That's the source. And the Greek, and the, and the Latin word for express is expressus. So it's very close. Very close to the way we say it. In English, essentially what that is is a transliteration. It's taking it letter for letter and taking it from an, uh, another language into the English language. It's not translating it. It's just taking it just like the, the, when you take the word baptize in the New Testament. You come up on the word baptize, all right? You find it time and again. Hebrew, uh, Romans 6, as many as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death, all right? The word baptize is not a translation. It comes from the Greek word baptizo, which is literally a transliteration, taking it letter for letter from the original language and putting it in our language. So what does the word baptize mean then? See, how do I know that? I have to trace it back and I have to find it in the usage in its context in the Bible. See what I mean? All right, I hope this is helpful for you. It's not what the word means today. What did it mean when they wrote it? That's what matters. When they used it, what were they saying? It's like us speaking today, somebody taking what we say a thousand years down the road and using what it means then and applying it to what we said today. They could completely change the meaning of what we were talking about. See what I'm saying? So therefore, you have to, you must stick with the context. You must stick with the age or the time that the word was used. Now, the word, of course, they give, uh, Mr. Webster gives us five different usages in the English language. Uh, in Latin, it means prominent, distinct, to press out, describe. That's what it meant in Latin, to convey it over into English. As it's used in English in this text, here's what it means. Copied, closely resembling, bearing an exact representation. All right? That's what the word means as the King James translators used it in the text. An exact representation. Does God have a body? Well, you have to know the essence of God, see, to understand what we're talking about now. We're talking about the new birth. Does God have a body? What is his essence? Spirit. All right? He's a spirit being. Okay. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. All right? Hear you, Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. That's the Shema from the book of Deuteronomy chapter number 6. That's the blessing pronounced upon that Israel pronounces time and time again. In, why did they say that? They say that because the Moabites had many gods. The Ammonites had many gods. The Canaanites had many gods. The Egyptians had many gods. But hear you, O Israel, O Israel, in the midst of all of this polytheism, the Lord your God is one Lord. You have one God. 
only one God. So therefore, the Israelite did not learn or understand his concept of God from the Ammonite right. or from the Moabite or from the Egyptian. How did he get that then? By direct revelation. In plain words, the whole world is a sea of darkness, and there's one ray of light, and that's Israel. Ancient Israel is the ray of light, and the ray of light does not come from any part of the earth. The ray of light emanates from Israel. And the reason it does is because their prophets are inspired of God. Right. So Israel becomes the source of the truth. And when you go back and study ancient history, you'll find that people, wherever they can be found on the face of this earth, have mixed concepts of creation, the beginnings of God, and so forth and so on. And you'll find, if you study that very carefully, and anthropologists do, that even with languages, they trace it to a single source. And that single source is Babylon. <laughs> Babylon was the beginning. Because at Babylon, everyone spoke the same language. All men spoke the, lang the same language. And, uh, it, and from that point on, the, you know what God did? He confounded their languages. The guy said, hand me a shovel. The guy hit him in the back of the head, see? Because he misunderstood it to mean he thought it was something else. The language changed. <laughs> you can't communicate. You can't do anything. And uh, so, this, of course, this is not all about uh, uh, linguists. But the thing is, it's important to understand that for so long and for too long, Christians have cowered under to so-called scholars yep. scholarship. Right. Yeah. And those who profess because of their loud voices to be the source of the truth yeah. and to know why we're here and to know what's going on, when the fact of the matter is, if you don't know, don't know the Holy Bible, you're ignorant. Right. Right. This is the source of truth right here, this book. This book, this Bible right here, Holy Bible. And the Holy Bible was written by Jews. They are the, to them was given the oracles of God. Not the Latin, not the Greek. See? Not the Roman, not the Greek. Not, not the law and not the culture. Not the law or the philosophy. The law was the Roman, the philosophy was the Greek. The Greeks had the philosophers. Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, and Maximander, and the rest of them. But the Roman had the law. He had the Senate. He had the, and, and that Roman law is handed down to us to this very day, many of the principles of it. So, But where does spiritual truth come from? Does it come from the philosopher in the Greek, or does it come from the Roman law? Where does, the truth, where does spiritual truth come from? What group of people? Only one. Jew. To the Jew. To the Jew. Our Lord Jesus Christ was a Jew. So if I want to find out something spiritual, I don't go to a Greek. And I don't go to a Latin. I go to a Jew. I go to the source of it. If I go to a Latin or I go to a Greek, I may get some of the truth, but I'll get it after it's filtered through their system and their, and their culture and all the rest of it. So when the Bible talks about the essence of God... The Old Testament nowhere says anything about a trinity in that sense, to speak like that, that God is a trinity. On the other hand, it nowhere says God is not a trinity. But we can find in places in the Old Testament where God is referred to in a sense that we say there's got to be something going on here because in the beginning God, God's a plural Hebrew noun, which means three or more, created the heaven and the earth. All right. Now, when he made man, he made him in his own image. The image of God. And if you'll know, we read this last week. If you'd like to turn there uh, with me this morning. It says in Genesis 1.27, God created man in his own image. The image of God created he him. Then in Genesis 5.3, after Adam had fallen and brought corruption into the human race. And if you want to know what happened there, just read Romans 5. The apostle spells it out for you. In Romans 5, he, def he tells you what went on. When Adam fell, Paul tells you in Romans 5. Paul, a Jew, see? <laughs> Not a Gentile, but a Jew. Interprets the Old Testament, and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, spells out what happened to Adam when he fell. He brought death upon all men. For as in Adam, all die. So the only thing Adam can give you is death. And notice what happens here in Genesis 5, 3. When Adam bore a child, he begat a child. He lived 130 years, begat a son, not, note carefully, in his own likeness, after his image, and called his name Seth. See? Now, on the street, the average man of the, of the street, go back 50 years ago, and he knew a whole lot more than he does today, 
But the average man of the street knows certain scriptural terms, just part of the culture. And he says, well, man was created in the image of God. Well, he was originally, but uh, he fell from that image. But you see, very few of them will say that. And then most people say, most people on the street, the man of the street, when he's talking about the Bible, says what he heard somebody else say. Because most of them won't take time to read it themselves. So when the Lord Jesus Christ showed up, one of the purposes in him coming was to restore that image and why is it so important to restore that image? Because of the essence of your nature, what you are. What are you? Are you a body? No, you're not a body. You're living in a body. When I go out here and get in a car, I'm not a car. But I'll use that car to go. It uses it. It's a vehicle. That's all your body is. It's a vehicle. All right? So what are you? Well, I'm a soul. Well, you have a soul. God did not create your soul. The Bible says he breathed into Adam's nostrils a, the breath of life. And what happened? He became a living soul. So what happened? Then God sent forth his life, the breath of life, into the body of Adam that he had created from the dirt. And Adam became a living soul. So now what is Adam? What's his, what's his essence? What, what's, what do we got here now? We got a body, soul, and spirit. That's what we've got. So when Adam sinned, against God. And I've heard people quote this to say, see where the Bible is wrong? Adam didn't die. Yes, he did die. His body didn't die, but Adam died spiritually. He could no longer walk with God. He could no longer commune with God. He hid from God, ran from Him. So the Spirit died. Even though the breath of life that Solomon talks about in the book of Ecclesiastes remained in him, the spirit nature of Adam, the part of him that could commune with God, and that's the only part that can, the Spirit then uh, died. And when it died, then Adam's left in a situation to where he's walking around in a body. He uses the same vehicle he used before. And then because of the entrance of the curse of sin, that body started to die. Because it was a body created from the ground and had not received the curse of sin before, there was no sickness. My, Adam's body lived on for another, another 930 years, 930 real years of 365 days. And then eventually Adam's body died. Adam's spirit went back to God who gave it. Adam's soul that had come into being, the identity of Adam now, because God had directly created a being, went down to paradise. He went down to the place where captivity was held. He had to go there because he could not approach or enter into the very presence of God. Only a spirit being can do that. And the only way a spirit being can do that is for that spirit being to be born again. That's why the new birth is so necessary to be born of God, to be born from above. All of these terms are correct when it talks about the new birth. You are literally born of the life of God. And no man in the Old Testament was. The, no, the only way a man can be born again is through the second man, last Adam. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only way. In John 3 now, when the Lord approached Nicodemus, or Nicodemus approached him, came to him at night, said, We know thou art a teacher sent from God. The Lord said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. All right. Now, I want you to look at that for a moment, analyze it. Was he referring to Nicodemus' moral condition? Or was he referring to a condition or a state that had to do with the future and eternity? What did you see? When you see that, what do you think? When he says, you must be born again. You must be born of God. You must be born from above. He was referring to, this, he was referring to a world in the future. And there is only one way he can enter into that world, and that is by the new birth. How do you know that? I know it by birth, because notice what he said in John 3. That which is born of the what? Flesh is flesh. You're here because you were born of the flesh. Here where? You're in this world. You're in this world because you were born of the flesh. This world accommodates the flesh. This world was created for the flesh. It has air. It has water. It has food. It has what's necessary to sustain the flesh. That's what this world's about. It's all about the flesh. The only thing this world understands is flesh. See what I mean? The physical. It's of this earth. It's of the earth earthy. It's a terrestrial body from the Latin terra, which means land. It's of the land, of the earth. It's of this world. <laughs> Nicodemus, <clears throat> you are born of the flesh. 
You're in this world because you were born of the flesh. This is the world that you know because you are born of the flesh. And this world was created to sustain your flesh. See? But you must be born of God. Born from above. Not that this world will sustain that or has anything to do with it or knows anything about it. The birth that I'm talking about is for a much, much, much different world. Better world. Future world. And the only way that you'll ever enter into that world is by the new birth. Amen. Now, he associated at that time with the kingdom of God, didn't he? He said, if you're not born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. All right. So now, when we talk about the new birth, that raises the preaching to, and teaching to a much higher plane than simply saying you need to be saved. You do need to be saved. And you can't be born again and not be saved. That's an impossibility. Salvation is certainly part of the new birth. But the new birth implies much more than simply being saved. And I don't want to belittle salvation. But you see, that's all you hear today. When people talk about the new birth, or they don't talk about the new birth, they talk about salvation. Most of the preaching about salvation means that God does, keeps you from going to hell and has a glorified earth waiting for you somewhere. Right? Yeah. right? You'll move into another house and set up housekeeping in a glorified earth somewhere and live on similar to the way you've lived here. Right. And that is the concept of most people. And this is what makes the professors at UT so mad. This is why they belittle your faith. They say to themselves, well, then your religion is no more in the world, is nothing in the world more than something that you've cooked up and concocted in your mind and you've made heaven just a glorified earth. And what you've done is create God in your own image. And that's what they do. I've read their works. I know. And when I first got saved, I read everything I'd get my hands on. I read everything atheists wrote, everything an agnostic could write. And you know why I did that? Because I knew what had happened to me, and I knew I could not explain that physically. I knew something profound had changed me, and I knew it was not of this earth. It did not come from here. I didn't learn it. Nobody taught me into it or, you know, taught me how to go through a process or steps and, and become that. Something profound had happened to me. Amen. And I began to go out and search for others that had happened to. <laughs> I wanted to find people of like spirit. Amen, brother. I did. I mean, I wanted to know. I mean, why are, you, why are certain people so critical of what you teach? Why do they hold in such contempt what you believe? Why has America become such a pluralistic, I despise that word, uh, all-encompassing, all-embracing, uh, a uh, secularist society? Why? What has happened? What, what's, what's wrong with the church? Why? What's happened to the message of the church? I'll tell you what's happened to it. The church departed from the doctrine of the new birth. When the church starts preaching the new birth, the way the Bible talks about the new birth, the anthropology professor can't handle it. Right. Yeah, I'll tell you why he can't handle it. He has nothing to gauge it by. Right. He has nothing to measure it with. There is absolutely no experience comparable to it except one who has been born again. Amen. It's beyond him, and he can't stand that. He can't handle that. The last thing you'll ever get an educated man to admit to you is that he doesn't know something. Right. Yep. Amen. Mark my words. Yeah. He'll skirt around this, bring up another issue, make a, drop a big word in front of you. He'll run and hide behind this or that. And he'll give you, well, this is said about that. And then some people see it this way and blah, blah. And doesn't bit more know what he's talking about in the man and the moon. But he'll never say, well, I don't know what you're talking about. That's a very unusual situation when you find it. Well, that's the truth, folks. Amen. That's the truth. It's the whole philosophy that they know it all, and you're a bunch of dummies in here, a bunch of, a bunch of rednecked, hillbilly yeah. religion, Amen. down home, mama, papa religion, and like you've got your guns and your gods. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Get into politics if we're not careful. <laughs> to that bunch of rednecks up there in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Those old coal miners back up in those hills. I'll tell you right now, some of the best people I ever met from Pennsylvania. Some of my buddies in the Marine Corps lived in Pennsylvania. Those old, came out of those hills up in there. Good people, boy. And, uh, but, you know, they got their gods and their guns and all of this and that. Well, I'll tell you right now, I've got the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yep, amen. And I know what the new birth is. Yes, sir. And I know what happened to me. 
And I know what the Bible says. And it says that every man that came on the face of this earth after Adam received Adam's condemnation and his fall and his alienation from God. And like I talked about this past Wednesday night, they are enemies of God. Not indifferent. Not indifferent. Right. E aliens. Enemies. Enmity. Right. And that's exactly where they find themselves. So, in the book of Hebrews chapter number 1 verse 3, he was the express image of his person. Now, if we are born again, just exactly how are we born again? I want you to look at the book of Galatians, chapter number 4 and verse 25. Galatians 4.25. Now, this is what's called in, classic, in a classic sense an allegory. Now, don't, just because it's an allegory, don't kick it out and say, well, there's no truth to it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> an allegory can represent the truth, and it certainly does. As the apostle uses it here in the book of Galatians, he said, For Agar, which is Hagar, is Mount Sinai in Arabia. So when you have a woman repre uh, is representing a mountain, see how the Bible does this? and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is. In other words, the physical Jerusalem on this earth. At 2,000 years ago, nothing's changed. It's just the same today as it was then. All right? And it's an amazing thing. It's still there. And another amazing thing about that Jerusalem that's still there is every nation on the face of this earth have a, has a policy as it relates to Jerusalem. Yeah. Amen. Yep. As far as, as, by the way, watch carefully. Benjamin Netanyahu may very well be the next prime minister. And that's no more than a month ago, by most people in Israel, it was con considered an impossibility. But now, because of, of the circumstances, what's happened, some things, he may become the next prime minister. And yeah. Benjamin Netanyahu, folks, is a very, very hard-line Israeli uh, borders. Uh, uh, he was like uh, uh, Menachem Begin. Uh, settlements and all of that. This is our country. This is our land. You took it from us, and we're not going to negotiate with you, and we've given you all we're going to give you. He's the head of the Likud, and that's the, and that's the position they take. But anyway, he says here, this Jerusalem, but let me get back to my point. You have a policy toward Jerusalem. What's the policy toward Jerusalem? See, what, what, what is the policy? See, here's the point. Uh, America has a policy toward Jerusalem. Russia has a policy toward Jerusalem. Brazil has a policy toward Jerusalem. Argentina has a policy toward Jerusalem. Uh, uh, Barcelona has a policy toward Jerusalem. Yeah. See? Yeah. What, what are we talking about? What, 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 is, what, what, is, what do you mean policy toward Jerusalem? What is the major issue right now as it relates to the whole world and Jerusalem? I know that, but what, what, what's the issue? Pardon? All right. And the next step? Capital. As far as Benjamin Netanyahu, he says, Jerusalem is the ancient capital of Israel, always has been, always will be. But here's the problem. They want to split it right down the middle. They want to hand some of it over to the, to the uh, they call them Palestinians. All right. And another part to the Jews. So therefore... The embassy of the United States has been for years in Tel Aviv. When you go into a country, do you know where you put your embassy? In the capital. You put your embassy in the capital. All right. The United States for years has hem hauled around and crawfished around and stuck their embassy in Tel Aviv. If the United States had planted their embassy in Jerusalem, do you know what they'd been saying? We agree with you. The capital of, Jeru of Israel is Jerusalem. So what would that do immediately to the OPEC and the price of gasoline? See, you see the politics involved in it? So they have every country has to decide, is Jerusalem the capital of Israel or do they have a right to that? So now we've got a dogfight going on as to whether, Jerusalem has a, whether Israel has a right to Jerusalem. The whole city is their capital. Notice, isn't that an amazing thing? 2,000 years later, how that all of the nations of the earth, why do you think, do you think that the world cares where Spain puts their capital? 
Do you, do, you think, do you think Nevada cares where Tennessee puts its capital? Not one bit. But everybody's interested in where Israel puts their capital. Isn't that amazing? I, th I think that it is. I really do. God's got a way of, of doing a thing, and there's no way he can get away from it. Right. Amen. All right. And so here's what he says in the Bible. He says this, John did, 2,000 years ago in the book of Revelation. Here's Paul talking in Galatians 4, and then we'll get to John. For this Agar, which is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. Watch this. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free. Now, what's the next statement here? What is that? Which is the what? How could a city be our mother? Well, if we let the Bible define what that city is, we can understand how it could be our mother because we understand the spiritual birth that's going on here. We're talking about the new birth, aren't we? We're talking about what takes place when you are born again, okay? Your connection, your roots, where do you belong? I don't belong here. My citizenship is in heaven. I'm a pilgrim and a stranger. I'm a stranger. But note carefully. We'll run out of time here. Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. All right? Now, let's go on just a little bit, just a little bit, and look at Revelation 11, 8. Their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. All right. Now, until this point... Uh, it could be anywhere. Right. See? Yeah. Until this point, it could be anywhere because it's not named. But notice carefully what the Apostle John says. Where also our Lord was crucified. Now that leaves all, removes all doubt. Where was he crucified? Okay, but he won't even give it the name. See, Jerusalem means city of peace. All right, he won't even give it that name. Jebus, Jerus, that's the way it started back in, back in the Old Testament. Then it became Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Jerusalem is the way they say it. The way a Jew says it, he doesn't say Jerusalem. He says Jerusalem. So he, he won't even give it the, the, the name. See, it's, it doesn't even deserve that name. But note carefully what he says in chapter number 21 of Revelation, in verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, <coughs> New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. All right, hold right there. Let's go back to Galatians, chapter 4, verse 26. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. John says, I saw it coming down out of heaven. Right. All right, logical deduction. Are these two referring to the same thing? I believe. Yeah. It's above, and it comes down out of heaven. All right. Notice carefully what he calls this new Jerusalem, chapter number 21 of Revelation, verse 2. Prepared as a what? A bride adorned for her husband. So we have a city that's a bride. Okay? There's another city which is a bride too. It makes good preaching. One's the bride of Satan and the other one's the bride of Christ. Babylon's the bride of Satan. And Jerusalem is the bride of Christ. New Jerusalem. Not the one on the earth. You see, if the Bible, if, if John had messed up and gotten kind of really, if he'd have gotten patriotic, you know, and, 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 and said, well, now, you know, I mean, this is my home. This is Jerusalem. He'd have completely messed up Revelation and the whole Bible because he would have had this Jerusalem of this earth begetting us. And it doesn't beget us. He used the one which is above that nobody's ever seen. And he said it's the above, the one above, which is the mother of us all. All right, now if that uh, New Jerusalem is our mother, who's our father? What's it say in Romans 8? Who's our father in Romans 8? We cry, Abba, Father. See? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. God's the Father, right? God's the Father. All right, God's the Father. We're begotten. He begat us with his word that was engrafted. Receive the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. The word of God, therefore, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Same was in the beginning with God. 
Is the Word of God and Jesus Christ inseparable? Yes. Yeah, they are. That's something that uh, any Bible scholar ought to think hard and long on when he starts messing with the Bible, too. The Word of God. Jesus Christ, the Word. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. All right. Receive the engrafted Word, which is able to save your soul. The Word of God. God begets us. The Father begets us through His Word. Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. I'm not talking about a physical birth. I'm talking about a spiritual birth. <laughs> called the bride of Christ. So your birth took place in a spiritual sense by Christ and his bride. Why does he call it his bride? Why does he need a bride? What does Christ need a bride for? Why does Jehovah in the Old Testament need a wife? Who's his wife in the Old Testament? It's Israel. Did he ever give her up? He gave her a writ of divorcement, but then he, he went out and his heart broke and he had to say, I've got to take you back. He gave <laughs> Couldn't stand it. He said, I just can't handle it. He said, well, since I've given you up, he says, my heart has moved within me. <laughs> and so he had to take her back. And the book of Hosea is a beautiful picture of all that. But now that's Jehovah and his bride, I mean his wife in the Old Testament. And you can't confound the two. The bride of Christ and the wife of Jehovah are two different things entirely. See? The Jew and God have a relationship to this earth. Christ and his bride has a relationship in the heavens. The Jew will inherit the earth. This because he was given that kingdom of heaven preaching about the Sermon on the Mount. He'll inherit the earth. Us, our inheritance is Christ and the new world and Christ and all that he is. Uh, I'll read this for you. I wasn't planning on doing this, but this is going to be a little bit of my preaching this morning. You all don't mind, do you? If I, I just sat down and wrote this out this morning. I thought, Lord, give me the words to put out. And so here's what, uh, here's what I wrote out. And here was the question. I said, why was God manifest in the flesh? Okay, why was he? All right. Somebody said to save us. Well, he certainly saves us, but that's not why he was manifest in the flesh. God could have saved you otherwise. Uh, to show us the way. Well, that's a liberal theology. Yes. Following his footsteps, you know. He does certainly show us the way. But you can't live the kind of life he lived. He was sinless and perfect. Amen. Uh, to work miracles. Well, men before him worked miracles. Jesus Christ was a miracle worker, but it's not about just miracles. There's a whole lot involved in just miracles. So why was God manifest in the flesh? To be obedient unto death as the second Adam. Upon his resurrection, to walk into a new world at a new life that heretofore had not existed. Every step into the future was a creative step, for he himself was that new world. As he steps into the future, that he is, all that are in him, go with him. In plainer words, when Jesus Christ arose from the dead, I know you see him seated at the right hand of the Father, but Jesus Christ in himself is a completely new world because he's the last Adam. Did you not come through the first Adam into this world? You certainly did. You could not be here today if you had not come through the first Adam. Right. You wouldn't be here. Right. You, there'd, be no, there'd be no humanity, no mankind. The Lord Jesus Christ is called the last Adam because he is the entrance into a new world. But the new world is not a new world created for him. He is the new world. He is the creator. And the reason I say that is because the Greek word archegos that's used for him means literally. We get, it's akin to our, word, our English word architect. And the English word architect literally means someone who creates a building. It's somebody who, 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 who forms, who fashions a building. Jesus Christ, therefore, fashions a new world. And the new world is not out there waiting for him. He's stepping into it. And every step that he takes, a new world comes into existence. Every step that he takes, he is a pioneer into a new life. He's the leader. He's the first one to go into it. And everyone that is born again will be carried into it through him. There is no way into it apart from him. You can't find that new world. You can't enter into that new world. You can't even know it exists without the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the new birth is about. It's about me and my relationship with God through Christ into that new world. And mark it down. When he enters into that world, creates it before him, all of this stuff that you know now, every single atom of this, of this present creation is going to move into oblivion. 
the elements are going to melt with fervent heat. There'll be nothing left at all. Then God will create a new heaven and a new earth. But he's not talking about Christ. He's talking about for earth dwellers. In the book of Revelation, it says they walk in the light of that new Jerusalem, which is the bride of Christ. Amen. Yeah. You see, it's going to be a while before he gathers together all in Christ. And he makes a new heaven and a new earth for those people who will live on that heaven, in that heaven and that earth. Our life is going to be in Christ. My life is hid with Christ in God. So you're crazy as a lunatic. I know, and I'm happy. Amen. Glory to God. I sit around sometimes, think about that, and I think he takes a step where there was nothing to step. Right. Amen. Yeah. Amen. He sees what was not, where there was nothing to see, but the moment he, he, he cast his eyes upon it, it comes into existence. Amen. Amen, brother. And it's all for his bride. Amen. Amen. All the rest of them get creation. We have the Creator. Amen. Yeah. Our connection is directly with Him. Amen. As a pioneer, He goes into what He goes into nothingness, and yet it becomes something as He steps into it. Amen. Crazy preacher, I am. Word of God, I'm a lunatic, but I'm happy, brother. I believe I got something. Yes, sir. I really do. I really do. People on the earth can be saved. Buddy, when you're born again, you're in Christ. Amen. You're in Him. And wherever He is, you are. What He is is what you are. Did you know that? As He is, so are we in the world. My identity and existence is absolutely, completely bound up with one man. Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And for the Christian to think for a moment that he could exist in any other way is foolishness. We're in him. And that's what it's all about. Father, in Jesus' name, I bless your name. Thank you for your sweet presence and the power of the Holy Ghost and the world to come. And Father, the ages as they pass before us in array, God, we can only say glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. Bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray, and for Jesus' sake we ask it. And amen.